Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like to learn more about our church, please visit our website at concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. So, turning the world upside down, right? How do we do that? How in the world do we turn the world upside down? How, how do we have the power as just folks to do what those early church disciples did and turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ? How does that happen? We know, I think there's record numbers of people are flying this Memorial Day weekend. I read the other day, Thursday was one of the biggest TSA travel days. They searched more bags and, uh, you know, picked up stuff and went, ooh, what is this? You know, more than for, for more people than they have since, since COVID, maybe ever. And there's a lot of bad weather around the country right now. How, how does that ha How do the planes get there? How do they know how to get there to go up to 40,000 feet and come back down through clouds and wind up at the right place? You know, it's, it's, it's not a mystery if you know how it works. I, I've mentioned before that I used to fly a long time ago before, before I discovered rock and roll and before I had vertigo. I flew. I was, gonna, I was actually studying to become a commercial pilot. And one of the things my instructor said we're going to do, I was not instrument rated, which all of those pilots are that fly the airline so they can fly completely on instruments. But he said, we're going we're gonna to train you so that if you inadvertently fly into bad weather, if the weather deteriorates, which it can do pretty quickly, and you find yourself in the clouds, you can get down safely. And here's how you do it. You get help. Uh, it reminds me of another sermon I did once where I used these four things that my instructor told me. He said, if you ever find yourself in visibility such that you can't see to fly anymore, climb, communicate, confess, and comply. You, cl you, you climb so you don't run into a cloud with rocks in it, and the mountains have a lot of those. Uh, you, you climb, you communicate, you call air traffic control and confess what you've done, and then you comply to what they tell you to do. That's, that's good advice for following Jesus as well in our lives. But that's, that's for another sermon the other day. But, but he said, you call air traffic control, and they will give you a radar surveillance approach, and they can lead, lead you right to the runway. So to prove this, he took aeronautical charts and put them all around the, the wind, put them over the wind, in the windshield and around the plane, all the windows, and you put, put it on this hood. It's an IFR hood, and this thing comes down. It restricts your view, so all you can see is the instrument panel. And that's the way you train on pretty days with an instructor how to fly instruments. So he said, we're going to go to, I, I flew out of Sevierville, that's where I'm from. We're going to go to McGee Tyson Airport, and we're going to do a radar surveillance approach. So what happens is we get seven or eight miles from the airport. You call air traffic controls a pretty day. They weren't busy. He said, yeah, we'll be glad to do that. And so they start giving you coordinates and the, because they're watching you on their radar. They know exactly where you are, exactly where you're going. They know how high you need to be at every point to keep you from running into one of those clouds with rocks in it, as we used to say. And so you listen to them and they say, turn right heading, you know, uh, 270 or, or, you know, turn right heading 275 or, and you need to be, uh, descend to 2000 feet and slow down to 90 knots. And they, and they guide you all the way to the point that, and, and I'm watching the altimeter while we're doing this. And all I can see is instruments and I'm listening to the air traffic controller and the field elevation, McGee Tyson airports, 800 and change, something like that, 800 so feet above sea level. And so I'm watching the altimeter, you know, and it's 1,200, 1,150, 1,100. I'm thinking, okay, we can't be more than 300 feet off the ground. I was a little bit disoriented. I was trying to keep track of where we were from all the turns. But finally, we're down into that, you know, less than 100 feet off the ground had to have been. And at the last minute, the instructor pulled the hood off of me and pulled the charts down from the windshield of the plane. And there we were. We were about 50 or 75 feet off the ground directly down the center line of the runway and we landed and he said I want that to give you confidence to know that you can always call these people and they can get you where you need to go at just the right time and I say all that to say this 
That's why the Holy Spirit is in the world for you and me. Now, airline pilots use autopilot, and there was actually one on that plane, but we didn't use it. An autopilot, and, and, and I don't want us to think autopilot, because that's not the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit doesn't dump an AI, you know, drop into our heads, and, and we're not robots, and, or, or we're not uh, being, you know, like puppets on a string, and uh, the Holy Spirit simply guides us through life, and we don't have to think. That's not the way it works. That, that's great if you have an autopilot in an airplane, but it's more like when you're flying it yourself, but you have this voice. You have this voice giving you information on a moment by moment basis to keep you out of trouble, to keep you pointed in the right direction, and to be sure you get to where you're supposed to go. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit is the real time presence of God sent so that you and I can level up. Yeah, I think that comes from, the first time I ever heard that had, was in reference to the gaming world. And even going back as if you're as old as I am, and you remember uh, playing um, Pac-Man or, or some of those other games, and the whole idea, and, and people still do it in video games, you want to level up. You always want to get to a next level. Level up. And that's what the Holy Spirit came to do. The Holy Spirit is the real time presence of God in our lives. And the whole point of that is so that we can level up as human beings in the world. <clears throat> and hopefully as disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, Turning the World Upside Down has been this sermon series where we've explored the book of Acts. And we've looked at these different ways that that the Holy Spirit has worked through the church uh, and certain people. And by the way, these people that we read about, you know, Peter and Paul and, and the others, they're just, they were just people. They weren't, they weren't special people. God used them in a special way, but they were just folks. Some of them, it seemed, weren't very good candidates to be disciples. Paul, a good example. But it's, it's God working through them by the power of the Holy Spirit that makes that work. And I want us to remember that we're no more or, or less, no better or worse than Paul or Peter or any of those folks. We're just folks that are seeking after Jesus. Jesus came so that humankind could level up. Through a relationship with him, we could get out of the mire of sin in our lives, the sin that holds us back, the sin that keeps us from, from becoming all that we were called to be. You know, God did that with the, with the Hebrew people, with the law, trying to get them do this and do that. And, and if you will follow my law, you will be a good person. The problem is, is following the law. I was never good at following rules and I still struggle with following rules. But Jesus came so that we didn't have to worry about following the law anymore, it would be implanted in us from the inside out. Every, the point of the law is still there. The point of the law, by the way, the Ten Commandments, if you want to boil it down to the Ten Commandments, every single law that God gave to Moses fulfilled one of two purposes, to create or uh, sustain a relationship with people, all the laws, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't lie, and the other, or the other point would be to create and sustain a relationship with God. So there's this horizontal thing and there's this vertical thing. That's what the law was meant to do. But fortunately for us, the horizontal and the vertical came together in the cross. And Jesus did that for us so that we could level up and we could be nicer to people and we could be smarter as the way we conduct ourselves and we can have healthier relationships and we can have more purpose in our living. And so God sent the Holy Spirit so that we can level up because it's your job and my job to get that information out to a world that doesn't necessarily understand that. There's a whole lot of people out there that don't understand how much God loves them and that they can level up. A lot of people think, you know what? People have told me all my life that I'm no good and I'm this and I'm that and I'm not smart enough and I'm not big enough, I'm not skinny enough, I'm not this, I'm not that, and I can never be anything. And God says, no, you know what? You were worth dying for, remember the cross. You were worth dying for and I love you and I want you to rise above that. I want you to level up and be the best you you can be. And to do that, God sent his spirit. And so, and so today, this is Pentecost Sunday, 
got the red drape over the cross to signify that. And, and so we're going back, uh, as we've been traveling through the book of Acts, we're going back to the second chapter to, to revisit that story where the Holy Spirit came to the early church. And I want to, we can't, we can't read the whole passage, it takes too long, but there are, well, I mean, take, it would take too long to preach on the whole passage, but there are some key phrases that I want to latch on to that can help us maybe understand a little bit about what it means to have this Holy Spirit speaking into our spirit, not through headphones in an airplane, but speaking into our spirit and giving us direction so that we can level up as human beings and do exactly what God wants us to do on behalf of his son in the world. So Pentecost, just so, what, why is it called that? Uh, and that's, good, that's a good question. Uh, it, it was one of the high holy days in Judaism back in the day. Remember, remember Jesus first came to the nation of Israel and then the, the mission spread out to the Gentiles. That's you and me, everyone who isn't Jewish. But it came first to them. And so that's why the early, the, the early church was birthed in Jerusalem, which was ground zero for Judaism. So just as Jesus said when he ascended into heaven, he told them, you go to Jerusalem, you wait. Wait there, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be deployed out into the world. So, so, so the Holy Spirit could have, could have just come to them individually, wherever they were in their homes, but I think it's very specific why Jesus wanted them all in one place, because he was forming his church. Pentecost was one of three Jewish holidays. It was one that celebrated the harvest and it celebrated God's goodness and provision to his people. And so it was that day when Jerusalem was absolutely slammed with Jewish pilgrims from all around the area. They were out in the streets. It must have been like yeah, New Year's Eve on Bourbon Street. If you've ever been down there and you're kind of walking around like that with the crowd. Jerusalem is packed with people. And it's then that the Holy Spirit comes to the disciples who were gathered together praying in a room and sent them out into that massive crowd to begin this business of spreading the church all around the world. So I want to pick up just a few of these key phrases and see if we can pull something out of that. One of them, let me get, let me get a Bible out. It says at the very beginning of the passage, and Paul read some of it, there's more of it, but it says on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. And we know that they were praying. They were all together in one place. And we, we don't want to miss that. The Holy Spirit does work through individuals, but never for the individual's own selfish good or needs. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, it's for the purpose of gathering us together with other Christians so that we can more fully and properly be the church in the world. Paul talks about spiritual gifts in other places in the New Testament. We all have them. And the Spirit works through those spiritual gifts um, to interact with our personalities, our skill set, our background, our talents, all these natural innate things we were born with, then the Holy Spirit comes and works with that then to create each of us who is utterly unique in the body of Christ. But when we come together then, we create more fully the body of Christ. Paul has that beautiful image of the human body as he talks about the body of Christ. And when, when we level up and let the Holy Spirit into our lives, then we come together as the church and the church levels up. And all of a sudden we're more powerful because here's the deal. You have a certain skill set, a certain personality, certain innate gifts. You are, you are just as unique as your fingerprint. And that gift works through you uniquely in the world so that you can't, you can't say, well, you know what? There are lots of people who have the gift of administration if that's your gift. I'll just let somebody else do it. No, because it won't be working through them. You are utterly unique. And that's why if we don't all take our place, if we don't all react to the Holy Spirit in our lives and let him level up, let us uh, help us to level up, then there will always be something missing in the body of Christ. That's how important each of us is to the body of Christ. The Spirit works with our flesh to create the body of Christ. Now, Mary, we read the story at Christmas all the time. Mary uh, was chosen by God uh, to bear the flesh and blood of Jesus into the world, and she did. But we have the same opportunity. We also, whenever we allow the Spirit to 
let us level up and take our responsibility as disciples seriously, we then become, as the church, the flesh and blood of Jesus in the world. That's why we're called the body of Christ. This is so important. And here's another one. Because each one heard them, uh, it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. I know I, I, I harp on this too often. Forgive me. As a culture, we don't speak very well to each other. We just don't. We're not very nice to each other, it seems, a lot of the time, particularly whenever we have our fingers uh, on our phones or our tablets or our computers and we're on some social media platform. God is depending on us to speak this language that he provides through the Holy Spirit to touch somebody else. And there's a lot of bad language out there right now, figuratively and literally. But, you know, the people there that day at Pentecost, they thought these disciples were drunk because, they didn't, they, because of the way they were talking. And, and these, were, these, were, these were not highly educated people. Some of them were, but some of them weren't. But it was really just a cross-section of people. Let's face it. Can we just be real? They were rednecks from Galilee. That's, and they were. Now, I'm a redneck from Sevierville, so I can relate. They were rednecks from Galilee. And that's why they said, aren't these men Galilean? Why, aren't these men Galilean? And, and why is it then that they're speaking in languages that all these people, and there, there were people there from all over the place, lots of different languages represented, but yet each one could hear what they were saying in their native language. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit allows us to speak to people in a language they can understand. Um, you know, t t today, if, if you want to have anything done technically, go find a 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old to do it because, because digital is their native tongue. They understand the language. They can take your phone that they don't know anything about and in two minutes know more about it than you do that you've had for a year because they understand the language. They know how to communicate with technology. And thank God for that because technology is the future. It's why we spent the money that we spent so that we could level up as a church online in terms of worship and then also what we do in Bible study and all sorts of other ways that we reach out to each, each other in ones and o's, the digital language. Because that's what you have to do. The message is the same. That's why we have guitars and drums in this room and a pipe organ over there. It's because people hear things differently. It's a different language, but it's the same message. And you might be able to speak a language that someone needs to hear. You may have a friend or a family member, or you may have a rank stranger that you run into that provides an opportunity for you to talk about the love of Jesus Christ. And you might be able to speak in a way that they can understand because you have some common ground somewhere. I told the story about being at a blues concert once and I was, I was standing at the stage just looking at gear. And the guy walks up to me. I said, man, that's a, that looks like an original Marshall JTM 45. And he was like, oh, you, are you play? Boom. And next thing you know, he's telling me about how his life's falling apart. It's, it's, it's speaking that language and you, and you can. Not everybody's, but there are people that you can speak to and they'll hear you and they'll understand what you're telling them. We are called to do that. The Spirit speaks through our accent to interpret the possibilities of kingdom life. It does. And it, it don't matter if you're from Sevier County like I am or it doesn't matter if you're from Rhode Island like my wife is. And she sounds more like, she kind of sounds like a southern Rhode Islander now. Uh, but she's been here longer than she was up there. She, she doesn't sound much like a Yankee anymore. But, uh, uh, but, but whatever language, whatever our accent is, the Spirit will use it to get that across to somebody else. It's crucial. Now, we want to be sure and, uh, and talk about these two images, wind and fire. All of a sudden, as they were praying, from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. It doesn't say that the wind blew through. There was a sound like the rush 
of a violent wind. And we started connecting this idea of wind because in, um, in, in Hebrew, the word for spirit is ruach, and it's wind. And in Greek, in the New Testament, it's pneuma, and we get pneumatic from that, pneumonia. It has to do with wind and respiration in the case of, of pneuma. But there's this idea of wind, and, and wind is powerful. Wind takes air and puts it in motion. We have, we have air. Air sustains us. But wind causes the air to move. I have a friend, and in fact, I'm going to see him tonight. Years ago, he's uber smart. He's a chemical engineer. And he was, he was explaining to me one night how the wind blows. Because I, I began being a pilot. I was just, we were talking about winds. And he said, I, 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 let me tell you how the wind blows, Trotter. And he said, there's, in, in, in the atmosphere, there's high pressure areas and low pressure areas. And, so, and, and air is, is, is a gas and it has some properties like a fluid and it flows. And so you have this air up in this high pressure area and it starts spilling over and going toward this lower pressure area that draws it. And because of other meteorological conditions, and when the air starts moving, it creates wind. And that's why there's wind. Think of it as just air going downhill. And that's what creates wind. I was like fascinated. And then I was thinking about this week, and I thought, you know, it's the way the Spirit works. The Spirit is on high. The Spirit comes from heaven. All these thoughts, all these actions, everything the Spirit does is birthed in heaven, and then it flows down to you and me with this wind. And wind can, can move trees, and, and wind can capsize a boat. But if you trim the sail properly, the wind can send you across the bay in record speed. And that's our job. We can't make the wind. And our job is not to dodge the wind. Our job is to set the sail and our spirit through worship, through Bible study, through fellowship, through all these things that we do as, as disciples gathering as a church and also on our own. That's how we set the sail and our spirit so that we're catching the wind and it won't capsize us. And it will actually blow us exactly where God wants us to go. Air sustains life. But the wind sets it in motion. And the wind of the Spirit sets you and me in motion as well. And then there's that idea of fire. And I love the idea of the tongues of fire coming down. And that connects, I think, to these languages that they spoke. But this whole idea of fire associated with the Spirit, think about that. You know, we, we sometimes think about fire negatively, but the fact is, the fire, fire is just, it is what it is. It is neither good nor bad. The fire can cook your dinner. Fire can burn your house down. It, it depends on what you do with it. It depends on the purpose. And always the purpose of God's fire is for our benefit. Now, sometimes the fire of the Spirit can, can make us a little uncomfortable when there's some refining going on. And sometimes there is this refining fire of the Spirit that we shouldn't dodge. We should, you know, if we know we're in the midst of something that's hurting us, hurting others, we need to let the Spirit come through and burn that away as dross and keep the purity of our personality and who we are as the dross and the impurities are burned away. So it's all sorts of images for fire. I like this one uh, because we're coming up on, there'll be a lot of people shooting fireworks this weekend, even though July 4th is the big weekend for that. And I, I was thinking about, and I've used this image before, but I'll bring it up one more time. I'm, I only have a couple more times left here, so you won't hear this story again. But I, I got to, uh, but I, this is just a good image. I was working, I'm going to be helping with uh, some fireworks this July 4th again with a couple of orchestras. And as I was working on the music, I started thinking about these, we program pattern shells in certain spots. And you know these pattern shells where the shell breaks in the, in the sky and it's like a heart or it's a star or it's a butterfly. I mean, there's some amazing ones out there. You've probably seen them. You know how those work? It's really fascinating how simple it is. You got to say a 10 inch shell and it's a round shell. looks like a 10 inch basketball. And inside, if you were to cut a cross section of it, there would be this, this break charge in the middle, which makes the thing explode once it goes up. But if you cut a cross-section of it off, it's filled with rice hulls. 
And embedded in those rice hulls are small little stars about that big. And they are made of a, of a pyrotechnic composition so that they burn just like that. And they burn different colors and they burn different times depending how big they are. On a heart pattern, usually they're red. And they actually, if you can picture the, cro the top of the shell, they're, in, they're literally laid in these rice hulls in the shape of a heart, these little stars. And they're laid out in there like that. And so then when the shell launches, the timer fuse goes off. And at about a 10-inch shell, at about 900 feet, the timer fuse burns into the brake charge. The shell explodes. And it sends those stars out. And if everything, if it's well made, they remain in perfect relationship to each other. So that that star shape just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And depending on what axis you're looking at, you see this perfect star in the sky. And that's us. That's us. That's the way this works. The Holy Spirit lights our fuse. We are formed in the image of Jesus Christ in church. That's the church is formed in his image. And the Holy Spirit lights our fuse and deploys us into the world and we just spread. And if we do it right, that image of Jesus in the world stays true and pure and people see us. And I think that that's my favorite way of thinking about the fire of the Holy Spirit. And there are lots of others. The, Spirit, the Spirit's fire lights the fuse that launches the rest of our life. And I want to, we're going to pray for a few minutes. Uh, because they were praying when the Holy Spirit came. And we're going to pray for a few minutes this morning. We're going to pray about some of these things. Because I, I want to make sure that we are allowing space for the Holy Spirit inside. And you know what? You get what you pray for usually. So let's pray. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, oh God, that you would entrust your, that you would come and live inside of us and all of that power to your glory you would release inside of us. And so, oh God, I pray that you would, you would help us to remember that we are much stronger together. We, they, those disciples were in one room together. Help us, oh God, to be together, whether we're in the same room or whether we're apart. Help us to remember that we are the body of Christ and that we all have a language that we can speak that can change, that can change somebody else. They may hear about you for the first time intelligibly whenever they hear it through our accent. And, oh, God, we pray for your wind of your spirit to keep blowing through this church, oh, God. Keep us moving in the direction you want us to go. Light our fuse, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit's fire, and light our fuse and send us out so that we explode into the community and beyond with this beautiful vision of Christ. We pray it in his name. This happening, my friends, it's happening at this church. It's been happening at this church for so long. This last little piece is so important, and we're done. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Everybody is eligible to receive a vision. And, and don't let prophesy, don't let prophesy spook you and think, oh, I don't know, I couldn't ever prophesy. I'm not religious enough. Well, I'm not either. But let me tell you about how prophecy works. It's been over 10 years now that some church members uh, were together talking and they thought, you know, there are so many people moving into our area that are retirement age and they are going to need help with their family members who have dementia. Not everyone can afford to go to an assisted living with a memory care unit. Isn't there something we could do to help these families with their loved one with dementia? And they thought, yes, we could do it. We could just do it right here in our church. That's prophetic. People prophesied that in the hallway. And we have been inviting persons with dementia into this church for over 10 years and changing their reality because someone opened themselves up to a prophecy. Back in 2003, there was this prophecy. We, we're in, we were in the gym over there having this service, and we were out of space, and we could not and please the fire marshal and have church on Sunday because we were just more chairs and more chairs, and it was full. And someone said, we've got to have a better place for contemporary worship because it's drawing new people into our church. We've got to build a building. 
And it took a while, but, but that was prophetic, and people caught on to the vision, and this vision emerged for this building we're in right now. And it's happening again. Parents come to us, and, they, and our, our children's facility is, is as far away as you can be from the worship areas and still be on this campus. And the roof leaks sometimes whenever it rains too much. And, there's so, and, and they don't have space anymore in the preschool. And for us to, be, to extend hospitality into our community, we have to have a place for children. We have to. A good place. A safe place. A welcoming place. And so people started prophesying about four years ago before COVID, we need to build again because there's a second phase of this building that was never built and it connects right over there. We get a preschool on the bottom, children's ministry on the top, and we can just keep reaching out into this community. And people prophesied, COVID couldn't stop it. COVID tried. COVID couldn't do it. You know what? People just said, no, as soon as we were back in the church again, this church never closed for COVID. We stopped worshiping together for a while. But as soon as we got back together, people were like, wait, whoa, 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 what about that building? We got to get, we got to get that vision renewed. And so we did. And it was because people prophesied the young men and women and the old men dreaming dreams. And that's how every church works. It's how this church has continued to thrive since 1865, when six people out of the ashes of the Civil War met at John Stone's house in Old Concord back when there was just a river there and not a lake and saw this vision of having a church in this community, that community at the time. Then later on, somebody had the vision because of the lake had run everybody out. Let's come over here. I could go on and on. I won't. We're out of time. But you get the idea. The Holy Spirit comes so that we can level up as individuals and we can level up as a church and get the message out that God wants everybody to level up and become all that they can be. For Jesus' sake and in his name, let's pray. Almighty God, oh God, gather us together by the power of your spirit. Send us from this place, oh God, so that we can truly be your disciples. Oh God, please don't let this fire go out Please keep the wind blowing. Please keep us receptive, O Lord, so that we may be your people in this moment to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name we pray.